The Lorentz transformations were derived by Henrik Lorentz and George Francis Fitzgerald independently to save the Easter hypothesis and the concept of absolute time, which is a central component of Galilean relativity. They were trying to figure out why the Michelson-Morley experiment, which came in 1881, showed no effect of the ether. They postulated a set of equations which led to something called length contraction. That is, a length L of some object would be transformed to a new length L primed, which was L divided by some new gamma, number gamma, when that length is moving along the direction of motion of the ether wind. If L is pointing in some other direction perpendicular to the ether wind, then L is an unchanged quantity. Their equations, then, would achieve this length contraction and would be able to explain Michelson and Morley's null result. The factor gamma was named the Lorentz factor and was equal to 1 over the square root of 1 minus the quantity b over c squared. There was no physical interpretation of the Lorentz transformations, the changes of x and t to give x and prime and t prime, which gave length contraction. And rather, they were merely trying to reverse engineer a result of equations that would give the Michelson-Morley result. The unfortunate thing is that they had to result in a lot of trickery in order to maintain this concept of the ether. In that respect, their, their work resembles a lot of science in which the theoretical work is trying to accommodate experimental findings. However, it also resembles the concepts of epicycles and cycles necessary to describe the, motion, the apparent motions of planets in the night sky, which, although it does work, and the Ptolemaic, Ptolemaic theory of astronomy can predict the, the motions of the planets, we know ultimately it's not the correct model underlying um, the, the description of planets. Einstein came across the Lorentz transformations in a completely different way. As we've seen, his postulates led to the idea of the relativity of simultaneity. They also led to the understanding that different reference frames will have coordinates x and t or x prime and t prime, and the new coordinates t prime are going to be a function of both x and t. As well, x prime will be both a function of x and t. In other words, they're not just a function of x t or x separately. Einstein was able to derive these functions and they were mathematically equivalent to the Lorentz transformations, but he used only the physical interpretation that these equations were the result of the constancy of the speed of c or the universality of the speed of c for all observers in all reference frames. The Lorentz transformations can be derived even if you just believe in the constancy or universality of the speed c. First, we're going to seek a set of equations which are linear. So something like x is a function of both x prime and t prime, and x prime will be a function of x and t. We're going to want to convey that these equations only are, uh, ascribe importance to relative motion. So there's not an absolute time, and there should be a symmetry whether we're going in the forward or backward direction. In other words, transforming from the x prime, the prime system to the x system, the unprime system, or the unprime system back to the, x, the prime system. In other words, velocities should change. We're going to suppose that the origin x equals 0 of, the fr of frame s coincides with x prime equals 0 of the frame s prime when the time is zero. In this case, we come up with a constraint when we plug in x prime and t prime that b over a has to equal v. We want light to propagate at speed c reported in either frame. This requires that for a light pulse, x equals ct and x prime equals ct prime. For light pulses, we can substitute for x and x prime using these equations, x equals ct and x prime equals ct prime, and we'll insert that in these equations right here in step from, from step one. In this case, 
we have CT is the quantity AC plus B times T prime, and CT prime is the quantity AC minus B times T. We can use the first of these equations to get an expression for T in terms of T prime, and we'll insert that into the second of the equation to remove T. In this case, we'll have T prime on both the left and the right side of the equation, and it can be divided out. Now we have an expression for just the constants A and B in terms of C. If we remember that B is equal to AV in the expression in step 7, then we have C squared equals A squared times the quantity C squared minus V squared. And this allows us to derive an expression for a. a turns out to be 1 over the square root of 1 minus b over c quantity squared. a is sometimes called the factor gamma, or the Lorentz factor gamma. We can use that in deriving what is the expression for b, because we remember that b equals a v, and therefore it has to equal gamma times v. This it completes the derivation of the, the linear equations which relate the x prime and t prime coordinates to the x and t coordinates. So just to reiterate these formulae then, using these co constants, beta defined as v over c and gamma defined as 1 over the square root of 1 minus v over c squared, and assuming that the two frames are moving along their x-axis with respect to one another, then x is equal to gamma times x prime plus beta c t prime, and x prime is equal to gamma times x minus beta c t. The times can also be found. c t is equal to gamma times c t prime plus beta x prime, and c t prime equals gamma times c t minus beta x. Notice that we're pu putting c's in front of all of our times so that everything has the units of meters. It should be pointed out that because the other two axes are not along the direction of motion, then they are unchanged in the Lorentz transformations. In other words, y equals y prime and z equals z prime. This set of equations then is the Lorentz transformations. They relate coordinates in the prime frame to coordinates in the unprime frame. Notice that as the velocity goes to zero, in other words, the frames are barely moving with respect to one another, then beta goes to 0, and gamma goes to 1. Also notice that as beta goes, v goes to 0, then the time t prime approaches t, because beta becomes small. That means that Galilean relativity is roughly restored as the speed gets small. These transformation equations, shown above, were first found by Lorentz in 1904, and they were used to justify the length contraction formulae, but no physical origin was described. They were also discovered by independently by Einstein in 1905, using only the postulate of the universality of C for all reference frames. It's important to know these Lorentz transformations equations because we will use them many times over in our subsequent work.